Now today's reading is from Mark chapter 1 and we're going to read the first 20 verses. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptising in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance. For forgiveness of sins, the whole of the Judean countryside and all the people in Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one, who, one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptise you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert, and he was in the desert for forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said. And at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets, and without delay he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And may God bless the reading of his word. Lord, we come to your word now, and we come in awe of the greatness of your Son, and we think of these words of John the Baptist and how great your Son is. And we pray, Lord, as we think carefully about your Word, that we too can begin to see this greatness emerge. Lord, and we can reflect ourselves, who we are, and who and how great you are. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we come uh, in this new series on Mark, and I hope, if you haven't uh, read the, the Gospel of Mark. I hope that you will. Uh, I really want to encourage you, if you haven't read it for a while, uh, you can generally read it in about an hour. Maybe if you're a bit slower, that's okay. It's really good to read it in one sitting. So I want to encourage you over the next number of weeks to spend a bit of time in it, to begin to sort of grasp where Mark is coming from. And we'll talk a bit about that this morning and think carefully about how Mark prepared the Gospel. Now, one of the most important themes in Mark is the king who serves. And as you go through, you're going to see that Jesus didn't come as an ordinary king, did he? He came for a king who cared about ordinary people. He cared about their plight. He could see their leaders, both religious and political, and how corrupt they were. And he came as a different kind of king. And that is good news for us, isn't it, too? 21 centuries later, he is still the king who serves his people, and we are thankful for that. So, when we think, we'll go to the next one, Mark. When we think about the Gospels, uh, the blessing that God has given us is that there is four, right? And you'd be familiar with that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's a real blessing for us because we get to see Jesus from lots of perspectives, and as John would say, you know, there's so many things that aren't written down because there's so much that happened. We could fill all the books. Well, God's blessing is we get four books. And we have this opportunity to really get, get to know and come to know Jesus in these four books. Now remember, the Old Testament is going to point us 
to Jesus in the Gospels. And then Paul and other apostles and, and Luke in the book of Acts are going to point us back to Jesus. But Jesus is always at the center, isn't he? And so I say to our guys, you know, we, we're, many of us are doing a read through the Bible in a year. And you're working your way through the Old Testament. But at some point every week, we need to be with Jesus in the Gospels. We never want to get too far away. We always want to be reminded of the things that he said. We'll go to the next one, Mark. One of the ways that we can think about the Gospels is we can think about it in terms of if you are standing on a street corner and you see an accident, right? And somebody else is on the opposite corner, in the far corner. And as you see your beloved beetle crunched in an accident, right? And of course the joke about beetles is even the crash test dummies wouldn't ride in them, right? They're so dangerous. But as each person sees what's happened, they see it from a different point of view. As each gospel writer writes his story about Jesus, they see things from different points of view. And they have different purposes and different audiences. And so we begin to see, we'll go to the next one, Mark, a complete picture of Jesus. And that's why the gospels are so beautiful to us. And we we're so thankful that the early church very quickly recognized the importance of these books and preserved them for us. And we're blessed all these centuries later to have them, aren't we? Four Gospels, and the Gospels are four views of one life. Now, the thing about it, Jesus, is he's not just any ordinary life, is he? It's not any ordinary life. Now, there's lots of biographies about lots of people in history. You can fill libraries full, and many are certainly worth reading. Think about you know, Winston Churchill, or uh, Australian prime ministers, or American presidents, or generals, or whatever. And, they're, and I read some of those myself, and they're interesting, and we can learn lots of things. But Jesus lives the most important life ever lived. Do you get that? The most important life ever lived was lived by Jesus. Well, that should be worthy of our attention. And I think, unfortunately, for the church, we find ourselves not, put, not paying enough attention. We look at the numbers of people who are church people reading their Bibles, and the average in Australia is reading their Bible once a week. How can you possibly know the Savior reading your Bible only once a week? It's not good enough. Jesus lives the most important life ever lived. We should be there constantly. And so, that's what I want to encourage you this morning. Now, one of the interesting things about the Gospels is that most of the Gospels, more than half of each Gospel is, in fact, the last week of Jesus' life. So, Jesus lives the most important life ever lived, and the last week of His life is the most important week ever lived. And here we come to Easter. Now, as Baptists, we often aren't very good at Easter. It kind of sneaks up on us and goes away. And other churches do a lot more preparation. I want to encourage you as Easter comes near that you spend some time in the Gospels. Think carefully about the last week of Jesus' life. The disciples who wrote these books, they put a lot of things for us to know about the last week of Jesus' life. Because it's so important. The things that He endured on our behalf. It's, it's humbling when you spend time. Sometimes our familiarity with these stories can hurt us a little bit. So my prayer is as we come closer to Easter, we'll take some time and God will give us a fresh view of Jesus' life. We'll go to the next one, Mark. So there's a few, few details about Mark. So Mark is uh, most likely... Uh, connected to the disciples. He's a very young man, most likely. The early church believed that John Mark, which you can find in the book of Acts, who uh, causes Paul great trouble. But later we find out in the epistles that he's reconciled to Mark. Some believe that the upper room where they have the Last Supper, that's Mark's mother's house. So he's, he's connected. Lots of people believe that, in fact, uh, Mark is a, a voice for Peter. And so, uh, very possible. So Mark is connected, although he is not a, an official disciple, he's most likely very close to the disciples. Now Matthew's an official disciple, he's an eyewitness, and John is an eyewitness, and of course Luke is a historian, isn't he? And he tells us right at the beginning, he's going to write an orderly account, and he's interviewing all the people that were involved in the story. And so 
he comes with a little bit of a different approach, but he's hearing it from the original sources. That's very helpful to us. Then the next one, Mark. So most likely Mark has written 50 to 70 AD. And why is that important to know? It's important because it puts the gospel very close to the source, right? So 100, 150 years ago, scholars said, well, the gospels are two or 300 years old from the, from the origin of the events. And so that then allowed for the idea that myth and legend could creep in. But as we've... As, as scholars have worked on uh, manuscripts and all kinds of things, they've come to most scholars, even non-Christian scholars, have come to the conclusion that Mark in particular is the oldest gospel and very early. Now that is important because it gives us uh, a hope that he's, he's very close to the events. And people could have, if Mark was wrong, people of his day could have put up their hand and say, you know Mark, you got it wrong. But they didn't. They didn't. And so he's very close to the original. That gives us great confidence. For example, the, uh, in Islam, the Quran is not written down for over 300 years. It's just an oral tradition. And eventually it does get written down. Where the Gospels, we have them within, within a lifetime they're written down. It should give us great confidence in the Gospels and the things that we read. Or how the actual events occurred. We'll go to the next one, Mark. Now, Mark's purpose here, one is to see who Jesus is as a servant king, but also Mark's going to spend a lot of time on the disciples. And we'll, we'll talk a bit about more of that in a minute. But it's really, as his audience in Rome most likely, and they're beginning to suffer and starting to face hardship, it becomes, Mark's gospel becomes very helpful to them. Because the disciples are very human. Now, if you and I wrote the book, we might make Peter a bit more like Superman, right? He doesn't make so many mistakes. And he, he follows Jesus with greater courage. But Mark makes Peter very real, doesn't he? And, and the reality is that's us. We see ourselves in Peter and the early followers of Jesus in the first century saw that as well. And so... Uh, that gives us hope as a follower of Jesus. When we fail, we see Jesus restoring Peter over and over again, and as he does for us. And then the audience, again, is in the Roman world. How do we know that? Well, right in the first chapter, he's mentioned that the Jordan is a river. Well, every Jew in worth their salt knew that the Jordan, of course, it's a river. We know that if you lived in Israel, but if you're in Rome, you might not know that. So that gives us a clue that he's probably writing to mostly non-Jewish people. But of course there were lots of Jews in Rome as well, and he's going to make some allusions to the Old Testament as he goes forward. To the next one, Mark. Now just quickly for those of you who like this, and it can be helpful to think about how does Mark lay out the story? And that can be helpful because, again, as we think about how he's laid it out, we can see where he's going to put his emphasis. And where he spends more time on things, often that's a clue to us as what's important to Mark. So when we think about the outline, the prologue or the introduction is very short. Think about uh, Matthew and, and in Luke in particular, we, we have a genealogy, we have Jesus' birth. Mark isn't really interested in that. He wants to get straight into the story. Now, some people say, well, maybe Mark didn't know. I don't think that's the case. I think Mark felt that the Jesus, his ministry was what he wanted you to be about. And he left that other parts for other people. But Mark is just going to jump straight into the story. And then, of course, as you work your way through these first eight chapters, you see this conflict, rejection, and this question of Jesus' identity. It becomes a key part of the book. Jesus, who are you? Now, in the first century, that was important, but guess what? In the 21st century, people are still asking the same question. And the question for us as a church is, are we ready to answer it? Because we know the Savior. We know who He is because we know His story. I think we should be experts on Jesus' life as the church. Because we know that, for example, statistics show us in Australia that 40% of people under age 40 don't even own a Bible let alone know anything about Jesus other than what they might see on an ABC special or an SBS show, which are often, as you know, very negative. And so we need to be the experts. We need to be able to go and tell them about Jesus' life. 
because we've spent time ourselves reading it and studying it and memorizing it so that we can share it with others. Now, when we get to 8 to 10, we're going to see really Jesus' mission becomes clear and what it means to be a disciple becomes much more clear. And then the end, we see Jesus heading into Jerusalem. We see the king as he rides in triumphantly and we see on Friday the crowds have rejected him. And he dies. And then we see Sunday he's risen again. And the power of the resurrection in that. So he's going to spend quite a bit of time on that last week. Those last six days. Again, it tells us how important that is to Mark. So we should pay attention to that. We'll go to the next one. Now there's a couple key themes as you're reading Mark, particularly if you're new to the Gospels. There's a couple things and sometimes maybe just defining a few terms can really help us. When you see Mark mention the Gospel, he's really referring here to salvation through Jesus. That's a very exclusive claim. In Judaism, uh, salvation came through the temple and through the priests and through the sacrifice. But as we go through Mark, we're going to see that Jesus is pushing all of that aside. The old is going to go. And in fact, if, if uh, most of the events happen between 27 and 30 A.D., by 72 A.D., within about 40 years, Jerusalem's completely destroyed. The temple is gone. It's, it's wiped away. And so here's Jesus claiming something very exclusive about himself. That I am now the only way to God. You cannot get to Him through the temple or through a sacrifice. It's a big thing. Particularly in the first century, to claim that Jesus alone should be uh, your choice. The person that you follow. In the Roman world, you could follow lots of gods. And of course, the emperor himself was a god. And so, you had lots of choices. And except, in this case, he's saying, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm the only one. I'm the only choice that you can make. And even in the 21st century, now we find ourselves, people criticizing us for saying, how can you be so exclusive? There are lots of paths and lots of roads, but it is Jesus himself who claims that exclusivity. Then, of course, you'll see the Son of God. And really, that's referring to Jesus' divine sonship. His origin from the Father. And claiming that for himself. He's, now, John the Baptist is a prophet and very important prophet. Very popular prophet. But even John the Baptist, as powerful as he is, is going to point to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God in the flesh and he recognizes that. And then you're going to hear the kingdom of God. And in Matthew and Luke, you'll hear to it, refer to it as the kingdom of heaven. Very similar idea. And it's really the rule of God. God's victory over sin, sin, death, and Satan. Where God is breaking through, where the kingdom of darkness is being pushed back. And so, as you read through Mark, you're going to see there's a spiritual battle that is occurring. Not just for the disciples and the religious leaders, but something is happening in the heavens themselves. And Satan himself is throwing everything he has at Jesus. And the people are caught in the middle and Jesus feels uh, compelled to help. And we see so many people possessed by demons. And we see many people sick and hungry. And we see evil seems like it's hanging on with its fingertips as Jesus pushes it back. And so that's, that's what, when we think about that, when you see and we think about the kingdom of God, that's really what he's referring to. That God's rule and reign is coming. That is good news as the, the light of the gospel begins to break through. Go to the next one, Mark. So he starts this way, and it's interesting, as, as we get to one one, Mark does a very interesting thing here. As the reader, he's giving us a clue. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. He's telling us who Jesus is right from the beginning. Now it's interesting because, really, for the six, next 16 chapters, the people in the story, the disciples, the religious leaders, the political leaders... They have no clue who Jesus is. It's hidden from them. It's a mystery to them. But Mark, is he's letting us inside. And he says right from the beginning, Jesus the Messiah. 
the Messiah, the one that God has promised. Remember, when we get to the beginning of the Gospels, God has not spoken to the children of Israel for 400 years. They haven't heard from Him. He's been silent. And so suddenly God is speaking again. Suddenly God is bringing His Messiah onto the scene. Jesus doesn't arrive by an accident. It is God's plan. And so Mark wants us to know that, that this is the beginning of the good news. Here it starts. Jesus has come. And again, it wasn't just good news for the people in the first century. It is still good news for the people of the 21st century that the Messiah has come. We are a long way from that, but that doesn't change the fact that the Messiah has come. And He's come for our rescue. Now, what I love here at the beginning in this first verse is you just get a sense from Mark how much he loves Jesus. Mark had his problems as well, and you can remember he he ran away from Paul and he got afraid and, and left the mission and he'd come back, and you can imagine his struggle. You can imagine Mark's fear and And you can imagine that most people, I think, don't want to be crucified or killed by the Romans. And that would have been a hard thing. And you don't blame him for wanting to run away. But here, at some point later in his life, he he has this great moment. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. You can imagine him writing the words and thinking and loving Jesus so much. The Son of God. That's how I read it. I read great worship in what Mark is doing here as he introduces his book to us. We'll go to the next one. And so at the beginning here in this first chapter, we see then uh, this, the, the first, the beginning, is, is that John the Baptist appears in the wilderness. Now what's interesting is all four Gospels include something about John the Baptist. He's really important. In fact, um, Jewish historians in the later first century will talk about John the Baptist as well. That he was very, very popular with the people. He was much loved by the people. And so here he appears, John the Baptist, he's in the wilderness and he's preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The people of Israel had fallen into corruption, had fallen into sin. And And it had been a long time since they'd heard from God. It had been a long time since the prophet had appeared. And John appears and he's preparing the way. And he he really encourages the people to begin to change. And we see in Luke that it isn't just the Jewish people. The Roman soldiers are coming as well. His message is being received very widely. He must have been a great preacher. He must have been uh, a, a... a powerful man and to be in his presence as the crowds are drawn to him. And he's reminding the people of once again to turn their hearts back to God. Turn their hearts back to what they know is true. Get away from the corruption, the sin, the death and turn away. Now the other interesting thing is in the Roman world if a governor or even the emperor himself was going to arrive or go through your town, there would be a herald. Somebody would be shouting and letting you know that this person's on his way. And that's really what John the Baptist is. He's a herald. He's announcing something is coming. He's not the end himself. And that was one of the questions that will come up through the gospel is, are you it? No, no, I'm not it. I'm pointing you to the one who is. I'm pointing you to the one who is. And that's Jesus. We'll go to the next one. Because he says here, and after this was his message, after me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, to me, is very amazing. So John is this powerful prophet. Crowds are coming. But John And John could have said, you know what? I'll take it for myself. Maybe I could be the Messiah. Maybe I could, I could do it. But he didn't. He didn't. He had the humility to say, you know what? There's somebody bigger and more important. Now, for the disciples, I think this gets a little bit confusing as we go through Mark because Jesus does not meet their expectations. They're expecting someone powerful like a soldier, like a king. And Jesus... That's quite the opposite, doesn't he? And as we go through Mark, we're going to see Jesus is caring for the poor and healing the sick. And he really doesn't spend that much time in the synagogues. He does a little bit, but mostly he's out where the people are. 
And he's not trying to create armies and become the king of Israel, is he? What's what the, the disciples' hope is. And as you read through and you, and you think carefully about the disciples and their journey, they are true Israelites. They are desperate for Israel to be free again. Remember, at this point, Israel's been under one army after another for 600 years. They've been occupied. And they are desperate to be their own country again, to have their own king, for David to return. And so the disciples, as we go through Mark, they got mixed motives. And Jesus knows this and He deals with them very fairly, doesn't He? And He keeps hanging in there with Him as they work out who He is. Isn't that us, right? We come sometimes to Jesus with lots of motives and lots of reasons. And Jesus is patient with us as we learn who He is. Now for me, last year, we'll go to the last one, Mark. Last year, uh, in June of last year, I was told that I have cancer. And that's a really hard thing to hear, isn't it? Some of you have faced that. And you think, oh, that's a storm that I did not expect to come. And like the disciples, twice in Mark, they get in a boat. One time they're with Jesus, one time they're without Jesus, and a storm comes. Now Jesus doesn't prevent the storm from coming, does He? But He's with them in the boat. He does not forget them. And for me, uh, as, as I uh, spent over a month in hospital, it was very difficult. It's knowing that Jesus was with me and with Ruth. He hadn't forgotten us. There's a, there's a, in the second uh, instance, you know, we see Jesus on a hillside and the disciples struggling in the storm. And they're miles and miles away from Jesus. And yet the text says... He could see them. He could see their struggle. Now in the first century, uh, Christians in Rome were often living underground because of the persecution. They had to hide away. And they would use the symbol of the boat to remind themselves of Jesus' presence with them. So for you and for me, I still think that carries power. And that's why we read the Gospels because these stories, they're more than stories, aren't they? They remind us of who Jesus is and the fact that He's still with us. And I was reminded of that last year as I, as I faced a very difficult storm. That Jesus was in the boat with me. That mean the storm didn't come. Didn't mean it didn't come, but guess what? He was with me every bit. And so for me, it, it refreshed that moment as I read these stories again. Oh, that's right. Now for you, I don't know what storms you face or what difficulties you face. But I know if you live long enough, you're going to have some, right? No one, no one gets through this life without some storms. But I wonder if you know Him. If you know Him well enough to say, yes, He's in the boat with me. That He's not distant from me. But I know He's with me. I wonder if you, if you know that today. I wonder if you know His power today. You know, the disciples, twice He calms the storm for them in the boat. And twice they're amazed, Jesus, how did you do it? One time He feeds 5,000 men and probably 25,000 people. And then the second time He does it, and they're still amazed, Jesus, how did you do that again? Because they didn't understand His power. They were still learning. But I wonder for you and I, you know, we, we have the advantage of looking over Mark's shoulder as he wrote this book. Jesus the Messiah. We know from the beginning who He is. But do you know Him? Do you know His power today? I wonder. I wonder if you really know Him. I hope you do. And, and if you don't and you're here today and you, and you want to know, I'd sure love to talk to you about it. He's the most important life ever lived. And maybe in somewhere on your journey, you've, you've drifted away from Him. You put your trust into other things, as He's going to tell us in the parable of the soils. Maybe the, wor the worries of the world have begun to choke out your relationship with Him. And as you read Mark, you're called back to that. I wonder if that's where you are today. The worries of the world. 
the storms that have come. You've drifted off. And you've forgotten, like the disciples, about His power. And the disciples forgot all these miracles that Jesus had done over three and a half years. So many that John says we couldn't even write them all down. And when they got to the cross, they forgot that God's power to raise Jesus from the dead. They all ran away, didn't they? They forgot. But Jesus was patient with them. And He restores them and He brings them back. And we think of Peter at the end of John and Jesus bringing him back into fellowship. He'll do that for us if you're here today and you've wandered off. And you know Jesus is calling you back into relationship with Him. You know what? He wants to restore you. He wants to remind you of His power to forgive. Today. If you need that, He is there for you. Not that His eye is on you. And I can only tell you from my own experience. And, uh, but that it is true. And I'm sure many of you have felt that way as well. So I want to encourage you over the next number of weeks as we get closer to Easter, would you spend some time in Jesus' life? If you haven't for a while, I want to encourage you to really make the effort to do that. Now in the garden, Jesus would say to the disciples who fall asleep, can you not stay awake for one hour to pray? I wonder sometimes if we can't stay awake for one hour to read His story. I wonder if that's possible today. So I'll leave that there, and uh, I'm going to pray, and then we'll finish up. Lord Jesus, we, we come, and we are thankful for men like Mark and Luke and John and Matthew, Lord, that gave so much, and your Spirit has written this book for us. Oh, Lord, we are thankful for it, and for its power for us. And they're not just mere stories, Lord, but they're the greatest story ever told. But Lord, we have to admit at times we've let it drift. We've filled our lives with a lot of other things. And maybe, Lord, some here today, we need to be restored. We need to turn our eyes back to You. And for some, Lord, you, that are here, they're facing storms. And Lord, would You remind them of Your comfort, of the fact that You are with them in the boat. You have not forgotten them. We are thankful for that, Lord. And as we uh, go out this week, as we move forward in this week, Lord, would you give us an opportunity somewhere, somehow, with someone to share one of these great stories with someone. Encourage someone that we'll run into this week with one of your stories. Lord, so help us to have the courage to do that. That we're not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of salvation. And Lord, the tomb is empty. A new life has come. And we want to live in that new life and we want to share that new life with our family, our friends, and our neighbors that are here and in other places across this world. Lord, let us not hold back with the life of Jesus. Amen.